Put it up. Good morning. How are you guys doing this morning? It's summertime. Okay, so no one is happy about it. Hey, this morning, uh, we are actually going to talk about some things this morning, a little bit of, um, I guess you would call housekeeping. And I grew up in church, and whenever the pastor would get up and say, we're going to have a little bit of housekeeping, I'd think, you are so stupid. Why don't you do that like on a night where you have a meeting and not on a Sunday? But I understand now why, because you want the whole church to know what's going on. So today, we're going to give you guys some updates about our building specifically and um, a restoration project that we're going to launch this year to salvage this space. Yeah. So, yeah. All right, good. I'm glad you're excited. Awesome. So as you can see over here with our wonderful ropes that we got at the dollar store, um, we can't sit in that section anymore because that ceiling is going to fall down and I don't want to go to jail. So um, we're going to try to salvage this place before then. But before we get into that this morning, uh, we got a video we're going to show you in just a few minutes. So I want to just talk to you for a few minutes um, on in this series we're in, whatever it takes, on just our responsibility as a church for what it means to build the kingdom of God. So if you've got a Bible, turn over to 2 Chronicles chapter 2, and we're going to start there this morning. And I'm going to call this message this morning after a guy that you're going to meet in a few minutes, Tim Andrews, who's been helping with the restoration process, getting it all together, the slogan that he keeps using called, Chop Wood, Carry Water. Chop Wood, Carry water, and hopefully you'll understand that as we go through this morning. Look at Second Chronicles chapter 2. If I can find it myself. Old Testament. <laughs> Second Chronicles chapter 2, starting in verse 7. This is King Solomon and uh, God having a conversation here. And he says, send me therefore a man... Skilled to work in gold and silver, bronze and iron, and purple, crimson, and blue yarn, and experienced in the art of engraving to work in Judah and Jerusalem with my skilled craftsmen, whom my father David has provided. Um, you know what? Go back there. I started at the end, not the beginning. I'm like, that makes no sense. Go to, go to, go to that was really good too, but go to chapter 2, verse 1. Okay. Wow. That coffee didn't help. Solomon gave orders to build a temple for the name of the Lord and a royal palace for himself. He conscripted 70,000 men as carriers and 80,000 as stonecutters in the hills and 36,000 as foremen over them. Solomon sent this message to Haram, the king of Tyre. Send me cedar logs as you did for my father David when you sent when you sent him cedar to build a palace to live in. Now I am about to build a temple for the name of the Lord my God and to dedicate it to him for burning fragrant incense before him and setting out the consecrated bread regularly and for making burnt offerings every morning and evening on the Sabbath and new moons and at the appointed feast of our Lord our God. This is a lasting ordinance for Israel. The temple I am going to build will be great because our God is greater than all other gods. But who is able to build a temple for him since the heavens, even the highest heavens, cannot contain him? Who then am I to build a temple for him except a palace to burn sacrifices before him? Then, verse 7, so send me therefore a man skilled to work in gold and silver, bronze and iron, and in purple, bronze and iron, I'm sorry, purple and crimson and blue yarn, and experience in the art of engraving to work in Judah and Jerusalem with my skilled craftsmen, whom my father David provided. Now turn over to chapter 1, just back a chapter, and that's where we're going to start in verse chapter, verse number 7. And what we're reading this morning is about Solomon building the temple, and I want to talk about this in the morning. So this is when God gave him the instructions for building the the temple. It says, That night God appeared to Solomon and said to him, Ask for whatever you want me to give you. Solomon answered God, You have shown great kindness to David my father and have made me king in his place. Now, Lord God, let your promise to my father David be confirmed, for you have made me king over a people who are as numerous as the dust of the earth. Give me wisdom and knowledge that I may be able to lead these people. For who is able to govern this great people of yours. God said to Solomon, Since this is your heart's desire, and you have not asked for wealth, riches, or honor, nor for the death of your enemies, and since you have not asked for a long life, but for wisdom and knowledge to govern my people over whom I've made you king, therefore wisdom and knowledge will be given to you, and I will also give you wealth, 
riches, and honor such as no king ever who has gone before you has ever had. Then Solomon went to Jerusalem from the high place at Gibeon and from, I'm sorry, and from before the tent of meeting and he reigned over Israel. Let's pray this morning and then I'll explain to you where we're going. Father, I thank you for your word and I thank you for what Solomon did in asking you for wisdom and the result of it in building your temple and ultimately beginning building your kingdom on earth, God. I pray today that as we talk through what it means to be builders of the kingdom of God, that you would speak to us, that you would give us a passion for building your kingdom, and I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. So, what we just read is basically all to say this. We have a responsibility as followers of Christ to build the kingdom of God. Solomon was the uh, third king of Israel. There was King Saul, there was King David, and then there was Solomon. Solomon was King David's son. And Solomon had inherited a whole lot from his father. His father was the greatest king, really, probably, that ever lived on the face of the earth. Uh, David was known as a man after God's own heart. But after David died, he appointed his son Solomon to oversee the kingdom, and to rule over the people. And Solomon began to rule, but God had had a plan from the beginning of having kings on the earth, when King Saul came in, that he wanted a temple built for his glory. You see, God is in the business of wanting some glory for himself. We don't like to talk a lot about that because we think that seems egocentric or how could God be so big-headed that he wants some glory? But see, God's not big-headed, God's just big And he knows who he is, and he knows that he created us, and he knows that he deserves the highest praise. And so what he really wants from us as human beings more than anything is a heart that brings him glory with everything in us. He wants us to glorify him. And so from the beginning of time, he's always trying to bring us into relationship with him so we can bring him glory through our life. And at this point in history, humanity was at the place where the, where the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God, was, was within a tent, and only the priests could go in there, and you had to make sacrifices to get to it, and Israel had gone on the journey from the Promised Land into the, or from, from, through Egypt to the Promised Land, and they'd journeyed out in different nations now, and at this point in history, even uh, Israel has separated from Jerusalem, and there's two uh, countries happening, and, and God's people are kind of scattered all over. And what God says is, I want a place for my presence to dwell where my people can come and worship me. And so he puts that desire in David. But the Bible says David was not allowed to build the temple because David was a man of war. David was a man who had so much bloodshed. And in the Old Testament, when when you were a warrior, there was a separation between a warrior and what would be a priest. There was a separation between a man who would fight battles and a man who would build the kingdom. And so God said to David, you're going to prepare for this, but your son is going to complete what I put in him. And so Solomon becomes king. And what I love about 2 Chronicles chapter 1 is Solomon doesn't at this point, hasn't begun building the temple yet. He knows the plans have been prepared. He knows what his father has commissioned him for. But at this point, Solomon is just ruling and reigning. Now, a little side note for you to, you know, you think about Old Testament people and they rule and they reign and they're huge and God gives them favor and he's like, I'll give you wealth and riches. And you're like, man, if I could just be as spiritual as Solomon. Solomon wasn't real spiritual, just for the record. The man had 300 wives and 700 concubines. So I just think it's exhausting, but like, you know, just saying. So the man's not got it all together. But the beauty of God is that he'll use us in our mess, even though we don't have it all together. Aren't you glad? Because if he didn't, then I don't have a right to stand up here. If we can't use messes, we really can't be in a building where the ceiling could fall on our head. Not, not you're okay. But you know, like the little pieces. It snows. It's beautiful. But, but he can use our messes and turn them in to our message. And so even though Solomon has all this mess, Solomon knows that he's created to give God glory. And so when God comes to him and says, Solomon, what can I give you? Solomon says, I don't need anything but wisdom and knowledge. And God comes back to him and says, okay, because you've asked for wisdom and not wealth and riches, I'm going to give you 
everything. I'm going to give you everything that you need to build my kingdom because you asked me for wisdom. And then in chapter 2 where we read, Solomon begins to assemble people to begin building this temple that he's been commissioned to build. And I think the reason he was able to build it so successfully is because he built it asking God for wisdom. A lot of times in our lives when we're beginning to build something or we want to help build the kingdom of God or we want to start a, a company or a church or we want to do something in our life, we just step out and start doing it on our own. And then what happens is it doesn't work right? What happens is things don't really line up the way they're supposed to line up because we try to go with our own wisdom and not the wisdom of God. If we want to be builders of God's kingdom, we have to first, like Solomon, learn to ask God for wisdom. Solomon's vision for the temple came after he asked God for wisdom. In James chapter 1, verse 5, it says, If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. When's the last time you asked God for wisdom to lead you in building his kingdom? Now, I know you might be like, well, I'm not the pastor, so that's your problem. You ask God for wisdom. But here's the thing. We all are builders of God's kingdom. Every single one of us that professes Jesus as our Lord and Savior has signed up for the greatest mission on the earth to build the kingdom of God. But I don't know about you, but I cannot do it on my own strength. We need his wisdom. If we try on our own strength, we will fail But with God on our side, we can do the impossible. We can build the church and restore the world. And so Solomon asks God for wisdom, and God grants it to him. And then what did wisdom lead him to? When you read through 2 Chronicles, and it's a beautiful story if you keep reading all the way up through chapter 7 and 8 with the completion of the temple. I wish I had time to go there this morning. But what you'll find as it progresses is after he gets the wisdom, he starts to rally the troops. Because this leader knew that if I am going to build the temple where God's presence is going to dwell, if I'm going to build the kingdom of God, I cannot do it on my own. You have to learn to rally the troops and to say, look, this vision is beyond one person or one idea. This vision needs something so much greater. It really needs all hands on deck. And this year, there's going to be things that we talk about as a church that we're going to do with our building, and there's going to be things that we're going to do in Africa, and there's going to be things that we're going to do right here in downtown that, we are, that, that I'm excited to roll out and to talk to you about. But can I tell you this morning that if we don't rally together with all hands on deck, it will never happen. It won't happen if each of us don't do our part to say, I will partner in building God's kingdom and not just wait for the church to do it, which who is the church, right? You are the, just so you don't, you, thank you, good job. You are the church. I'm not just going to wait for the church to do it. Uh Uh-oh, that's us. Okay, I'm not just going to wait for the pastor to do it, but I am going to rally together and I am going to build God's kingdom. God's intention was never that we do anything alone. He created us for community. He created us for each other. He created us to partner with him to build his kingdom on earth. And that's what Solomon did. He began to rally people together and started building the temple. This was a massive task. If you read through 2 Chronicles, God literally gives him all the specifics of what he's supposed to build. It's like when Noah built the ark and God's like, it's got to be this long and this wide and this high and all. You're like, why does God care about that? You know why I think God cares about that? It's because God cares about the details. You see, it's easy sometimes to look at projects and things that, that, that we get up here on, on, on the platform and talk about and building a school in Africa and churches and, and all this stuff. And it's easy to be like, I don't really know that God cares. And, and I'd, rather, I'd rather put my time or my money into something that isn't necessarily a physical building. But the, the world we live in today, God uses buildings to reach people. And the details that he gives us and gives the instruction of the temple shows you that God does care about the little things. 
God does care that we have a place where we can come together to glorify him. God does care when he gives you visions, and sometimes you'll see visions of things, and all of a sudden you, you, you get this vision for wanting to build something out in the middle of wilderness, and you're like, why would God care about the wilderness? Because God's in it. He's in everything. He uses everything for his glory. The Psalm says the trees clap their hands. Jesus said, if, the, if you don't worship me, the stones will cry out. All of creation is crying out for God, and he cares about every little intimate detail And so together we rally and we focus on what God calls us to do. And then after that, Solomon began to look at those details and he did what we call at God's house, sweat the small stuff. I do a lot of sweating up here. The small stuff. Sweat the small stuff because the details matter to God. You know, it's really easy sometimes in ministry, if I can just be candid, to not sweat the small stuff. I'm going to tell on myself, because I do this sometimes, and I confessed yesterday, and it's, it's just hard. My wife has a minivan. Not, not a fan of those things, but anyways. We got this van, and when you pull in the parking lot out here, there's like this big telephone pole right between, you guys know, like between the, the building and there. And I come over here most days, and, and some days I have the van. If I have my car, it's smaller. I can get in there and maneuver, but I can't really maneuver the van in. And so if you pull through, you got to pull through, and you got to drive all the way around them. It's a very big process. It takes like a total of 30, 13 seconds, but you got to drive all the way around the parking lot and come back. And so what I like to do is I just drive right across the lawn and park my car right there. I know, sorry, Caleb's mowing the lawn now. Um, <laughs> And so yesterday, I like just did it. I was, I was driving my buddy TJ, and we drove in, and I drove right across the lawn, and I went, I really need to stop doing this, because my wife is scolding me now. If I did that at home, I'd be in, I'd be in the guest room. But just saying, I might need to be in the guest stage here. Sorry, Caleb. But it's easy to be like, ah, it doesn't really matter, right? There's just some tire tracks in the lawn. The problem with that is that tire tracks in the lawn really don't jeopardize your character. But when you begin with tire tracks in the lawn, and then you're doing the same thing when it comes to your finances, or the same thing with your relationships, and it it really doesn't matter if if, if I just kind of dabble, right? Because you begin cutting corners if you don't sweat the small stuff. And so Solomon took all the details God gave him, and he said, I will follow this verbatim of what God said to do, and I'm not going to cut corners, and I'm not going to say, I'll just put lipstick on a pig, and I'm not going to say, I'll just make it look good and make everybody think I got it together when I really don't have it together, but instead, I will do exactly what God calls me to do and follow with integrity what he asked me to do. The details matter to God, so we need to sweat the small stuff. And the last one, if you're writing down this morning, I'm going to preach short. You're welcome, because Tim's going to come join me and talk about the building. But the last one is that we have to count the cost, and that's what Tim is going to talk to us about in a few minutes. I'm going to show you a video in just a second here, but uh, if, if you read in the New Testament, Tim's got the verse Luke 14, uh, Jesus is talking about, does anyone go and build something without counting the cost? And sometimes what we do sometimes is we run so fast towards something and what we believe God is telling us to do, and then we don't count the cost and we get so far into it and we're halfway through and we can't finish what he told us to start because we didn't first count the cost. And so that's where we are right now as a church when it comes to building this church. The reason, the why behind why we're going to try to do some restoration to this building is simple because I truly believe that in order for us to build the kingdom of God together, we have to have a place to do that. It's, it's easy when you just come in here on Sunday and you think, why would you repair a building? We're only here one day a week. Well, well a lot of, we are here one day a week for services, but out of this building all week long, ministry happens. Out of this building all week long, things are happening and people are coming in and using it and, and, and people are coming and praying in this altar and people are, are coming here for prayer service Tuesday nights and people walking off the street. We're planted as a church right at 6th and Gallatin on purpose. And it's really easy sometimes to go, why don't we just go buy a new building or find somewhere easier? Why would we have to try to restore a building? But the more we prayed about it as a stewardship team and talked through ideas and options, the more I really believe God was like, I have you here. I've given you this thing in your hand. So now use what's in your hand. Use the wisdom I give you. Rally people together. Follow the details. Sweat the small stuff. And then count the cost and see what he can do, not us. Because my, my bank account is not big enough to do this, so I need you all, all right? 
So what we're going to do for the next few minutes is I want you guys to check out this video we put together of some of the stuff we've already started. You've noticed the stairs out front. Um, some people have already started donating to the building fund, and so that's part of that out there. Um, and kind of see some of the things on the video, and then we'll have Tim come talk to us. Let's check out this video. So that's kind of a picture of what the building is at right now. Will you guys welcome Tim up here, <laughs> joining me? <laughs> you have a fan section. As Tim's getting set up here, I wanted to also acknowledge there are a lot of people in this church that for 16 years have worked on keeping the building going. Jesse Hart sitting back there, brother, who oversees maintenance stuff. Um, Abel Garcia, I don't know where he's at, if he's here, um, and I'm sure there's a lot of others. I know Dan, Drew, all you guys. Like this, there's, just so those of you that don't know, if you're not one of the guys that comes and helps all the time, there's such an awesome troop of guys that has maintained this building for a lot of years. And what's happened over all these years is they've had to maintain everything without money. True? True. Because we, we do a lot of ministry, and we do a lot of good in our community, and we do incredible things, and the reality is, this is, please don't take this wrong, but because of where we're located, we don't take in a lot of money compared to most churches our size, if we're just being really blunt. And that's fine. That's what we signed up for, right? Because we want to be a church that reaches everyone, and we don't want to be a church that just reaches people that can fill our bank accounts. That's not the point of what we do. But the reality is, because of that, it's been amazing to watch as God has used what little we've had in our hands to sustain the building to this point. But over the last year, we started assessing and realizing that we're no longer able to just sustain. We've got to actually get to restore. And restoration takes money, and it takes work, and it takes time, and it takes counting the cost. So that's why Tim is here. Uh, I want to tell you guys a little bit about Tim. Tim is our community engagement coordinator here at the church. He basically is the one who connects us to everything possible. He's been in this role for just under a year, and I will tell you that we are connected everywhere now. It's amazing. This guy doesn't sleep. You can ask his wife. He really doesn't sleep. And you put him and myself together and a couple other people that hang with us. And, and uh, what's that? Dangerous. It's, very, it's dangerous because who needs sleep? We'll get sleep when we're dead. That's what I think. And though I've died a few times, I feel like. But... um. But he has, he has began connecting us into the community everywhere, and part of that has been counting the cost for how can we transform this building beyond just our church and also partner with the community. So Tim, you want to tell us a little bit about some of the things you found with this building and what some of the immediate needs that we're going to address in the next well, first, year? Well, uh, first, 
let me start with, this has been going on for 10 or 11 months. We've started this process uh, with Indiana Landmarks oh, actually last July, and we've been positioning ourselves to figure out how we're gonna restore the building and then how we're gonna raise the money. So the goal is to get the building to maintenance level, all right? So we're not always just putting out fires and you know, this and that. So <laughs> the, goal, the goal is to get the building back to maintenance level. Uh, and so as you can see, we have water infiltration. We have to stop the water in order to save the building. I mean, that's it in a nutshell. Um, so we've been accruing costs. Um, so to stop the water that you're seeing coming into the building right now, we're looking at approximately, should I go to the money? Sure, go to the money. Okay. So we're looking at around <laughs> 45000 to $50,000 that we need within the next year or so to stop the water. And then to get the building into maintenance position where we're stopping the water and we're starting to patch some of the things, fixing the windows. There's 90 windows in here and, and they have not been painted in years. So we have exposed wood that's allowing fil infiltration into the stone, et cetera. So, so over the next seven years beyond the 45 we need pretty quickly, we need another 100,000 to get the, ba the building to maintenance level. Uh, and part of the Indiana Landmarks thing is that there's a matching grant that comes with that money. So, we're, and that's $50,000, but we need to get the $50,000 on hand to get the matching grant. Cool. Just, you know, no big deal. Yeah. So, so here's, actually, it isn't <laughs> that big of a deal, I think. So I'm just going to, yeah. So um, when we started the research for this, we had one guy come out here and tell us it'd be over a million dollars to redo the tuck point on the outside of the building. And um, after we got off the ground, I asked him if he wanted to buy a building, and he said no. And so um, we started talking to different companies and different people saying, what does this really cost trying to get a, a really good analysis of it? And when, when you look at $150,000, it seems like a lot of money, but really to restore a building of this magnitude to a point where it is able to be a church that we can continue being, let me say a church our kids can keep building, it's really not that much money. And then what's really cool is we were connected to the Sacred Places organization through Indiana Landmarks where they want to come and they train, we'll take five people from our congregation that will go and be trained on how to fundraise and church growth um, around restoration projects. And they only pick two church, or eight churches a year uh, and they weren't going to do Grant County, but when they came and met with us, they said, we really would love to uh, work with you guys and really help empower you to raise the funds you need. Because we know that the reality is within our own church, it's going to be hard to come up with an extra $150,000 above our regular budget. But if we can get outside of our walls and through connections that you guys have or connections we have, begin to tell people what we're doing downtown and trying to restore a landmark in downtown. Another really cool thing um, that we forgot to mention is that in the spring of this year, we will be a registered, um, yeah, we'll be, what's it called? We're in the National Registry. The National Registry for Historic Buildings. Isn't that cool? That's like, so we found a lot out about this building. This yeah. is actually the second the second oldest building, oh, oldest commercial building. Second oldest church. Second oldest commercial, yeah, so church in the city. Um, and so they, we were a great shoe-in fit to get onto the historical registry. And uh, we've had tours through here. We've had different events through here. Every single person that walks through these doors, when they come right back there, their jaw always drops looking at the window, which I'd like to point out that Jesus has returned. <laughs> He's back. Thank you for those that donated. Um, he has returned. So, and we didn't, he's still here in the rest of the windows. The windows are good. Um, so we have a lot we need to do, but I really, I actually don't think it's that, that massive of a task. I think that if we partner together and we uh, get out and we rally together, that it's very doable and it's able to be in a place where we can salvage this building beyond ourselves and beyond just us. Because we're not doing it just for us. We're doing it for all those kids that are downstairs who will be the ones sitting here in 20 and 30 years and do it in a place where it continues being a church our kids can keep building. Well, I don't really know where to, where to start, but <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess I'll start at the end. I mean, we really need help, right? I mean, we need people to step to the plate. 